talk about House of Cards. Let's get into it. Well, first off, I noticed that Frank Underwood, his characters were not even remotely under control like he used to be. I feel like the, the first two seasons were great, were great and has really changed my perspective as far as how I see uh, Washington. I agree. How those people think of us and how they yes. think of their, their careers and how they Absolutely. think of it. So I actually probably gave them a lot more credit than was due for House of Cards. I felt like whoever wrote the show knew a lot about that world and kind of gave us a glimpse. Of yeah, and I'm sure the pushback to that would be it's fiction. If it's exaggerated, it's only slightly exaggerated. And I think the people in Washington, D.C. just might be even more evil than these people. I mean, I truly believe that our leaders are evil. So the walk away with House of Cards is that your leadership, the people that run your country and govern and legislate your lives, are not just corrupt or greedy and not just power hungry, but actually evil people, evil people that yeah. you shouldn't leave your kids alone with. And I actually think that's why it resonates. Let me just tell you this. I've been disappointed with this year. It's much more partisan. And to be honest with you, I think it's going to hurt itself. I really do. I think it's going to lose viewers. It might lose me. I'm not nearly as entertained with it. I don't want to hear political lectures. I don't want more of the same. One of the things that this show had gone for it was it had us in as dark as it was and as immoral as it was, it had a thread of intellectual honesty about it. This year, it does very similar to what, like, the West Wing does and all these things, is it uses its platform, and it uses time looking over your shoulder, rearview mirror, Monday morning quarterbacking, as a way of politically manipulating its fan base. And I just don't appreciate that. I think it's low-hanging fruit. It's cheap, and the show's better than that. And it's lazy. Up until this point, I felt like the show did a great job of not doing that, and that's what really disappointed me, was that it decided all of a sudden to do a 180 and not show us corruption across the board and how horrible these people are because this thing which is not supposed to be a career has become a career um, and how low they're willing to go to, to promote themselves to exactly what you said, to push an agenda, which any other stupid show that has to do with politics does. And that the reason this was such a runaway hit was because for seasons one and two, it didn't do that. Absolutely. And, and, and the premise that they took, which I, I think really resonated, they looked at government and then they looked at people and they painted this real clear contrast, us versus them. And that was R or D. That was donkey or, or elephant. It was us versus them. But this time it's all, you know, progressive this and progressive that. And, and look, you know, if you're progressive, you're probably liking it. I mean, and then I get that the Beltway is a bunch of lunatics. I get all that. I get the pressure the writers probably feel. And, but on an artistic level, it's disappointing. Listen, you know, and, and if you're one of these listeners and you're thinking, oh, these two are conservatives, they don't like it. Listen, we get bombarded by this kind of propaganda all the time. This is nothing novel or new. It's a genuine disappointment in a show that chose to take the high ground, and at least this season, just did it. Just did it. You know, it's just yeah. like you said, lazy, in my opinion. And but, 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 but to get into the nuance of the show, Underwood is vulnerable. I think you've noted that, right? He's vulnerable for the first time. He doesn't seem nearly as cocky. He doesn't seem nearly as confident. I haven't gotten to the end, so I, I can't speak to that. But he does seem on tilt, and that's unusual. Any time in the past where he's even had a... Uh, it, was, it was written like a uh, big-budget Hollywood movie where this guy you're following comes out on top. So, and you're, you're, looking, you're, th you're looking at it and thinking, this is never, never going to turn around for him. But in the, in the previous season, he's been you know, so Machiavellian, so his... his Plots have been so well orchestrated, and he deals with he deals with these situations that come, you know, almost like un, like unpredictable people, unpredictable events. And him and his wife had this plan, and along with the whole political nonsense and the propaganda crap. We can just go ahead and give a little bit of heads up. It, it takes place, I think, it's about six months after the last one. He's in power. He's really not popular. He's not popular with the Republicans. He's not popular with the Democrats. Uh, you know, the political parties are very polarized. You do see a little bit of back and dealing. Really walks in lockstep with, say, the last six months to a year of our own actual government. I mean, they're just straight up ripping off scenarios. And, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. like unbelievable how much it mirrors. So he's he's just not, uh, he's, he's doing the, the, the Underwood thing where he's, so he's saying one thing, but we know for a fact that he's got other plans and that the whole time his wheels are spinning towards other ends. But it's not nearly as well orchestrated. These curveballs actually make him lose his temper, actually make knock him off kilter. Uh, his wife and him are very divided emotionally and physically. They're separated. There's a lot of division in the team Underwood, which I thought, even with all their crazy problems, that was one thing that was 
really interesting was that they really served each other's purposes and for such formal and selfish yes, people, yes. they seemed to really care about the well-being of each other, which, which was really, really interesting. You know, before this, yeah, they, yeah, could all, right. they could always get under the, the commonality of, well, we got somewhere else to go, we got another level to go, we got some dragon to slay, but this time... There is no higher branch to climb on this power tree. Well, keep, well, keeping power would be the higher branch. The highest branch would, and you know, the goal is basically set for this season is we we kind of won the presidency by default. Now let's win it through an election and let's let's you know keep the power. I don't I don't even know if you know obviously you got several people write, writing Frank Underwood he's a fictitious character, but I don't even know if he really has any ideology other than his own power. power. Power, and that, yeah, and that's that's different than the president we have right now. The president, president we have right now, devoted he's an, dog he's with an, I, he's an ideologue. Um, he, he does, and he, of course, we can't help but go back and forth with, between reality and what's going on in the in house of cards. But uh, Obama does something very, very interesting. Where lately, I've noticed within like let's say the last two years, where he he does this like little tester thing where he'll he'll do something a little unconstitutional or. He'll, he'll float the idea of doing something real co- unconstitutional, and then he'll just commit to it and go ahead and go full fledged. And once he sees that nothing's happened, nothing's going to happen to him, he just goes ahead and takes the next step further, next step further. And right, you get a, right. a couple crying Republicans and a couple crying conservatives, and they say, Oh, you can't do this, you can't do this. But it doesn't seem, you know, nobody does anything. So There's no consequences. The and, and he doesn't seem nearly as charming or as interesting as the Frank Underwood character. And that's kind of. Frank Underwood was did everything backdoor. It was all backdoor. He'd make one promise. He, you know, he wasn't afraid to kill people. He wasn't afraid to set people up. He wasn't afraid to have people encourage people to kill themselves in order to get what he... In this season, you see a lot less of that. You see a lot less of that going well. And there's also this really interesting sub-story, subtext going on with his old Stephanopoulos character. Like his old... Yeah, right yeah. Hand his, man. Old, so his right-hand man, right. Which, which is just a whole... For me, the show's dark and hard to watch, but this whole five episodes or five and a half episodes for me have been painful to watch. Awkward, terrible, bad feeling at the end of it. Really yeah, hard. I agree. The dungeons of the soul that they're taking us are really getting dark without any redeeming qualities. No redemption. I mean, in other shows where you have an anti-hero, uh, you, you can find something they're doing at the end. Just kind of, so this dude is just a horrible dude in a horrible situation. Uh, if, if this was reality, the darkness that would be inside of this guy, the darkness that he would have to tend to, it would no no uh, ends would justify these means. He would be eaten alive from the inside out. However, to, to contradict myself, you look at the Clintons and the and the Obamas. They are doing a lot of the same. And there's been clear murders that have washed up on the Clinton shore. There's livelihood and and professional destructions and, and slandering. And I mean, a lot of their stuff. In fact, you know, one of the things you, you alluded to a lot of this, but let me just say this because that struck me as well. You know, the stuff that we're seeing on, on the plot line this year, I think just totally lifted. I mean, I was shocked by how much they just lifted the scenario. And the one you alluded to is just the unconstitutional audacity that, that Underwood has. And he figured out, and I think they're using this as a plot model, the president figured out something. It was a glitch in the system, I suppose. But really, it's just don't put a man without character in the White House. That's the glitch in the system. They never. I don't think the founders ever thought they would they would see a man ascend to such a high position that that had so little respect for the actual system. So what we have in the in the White House is every bit of a, a Manchurian candidate in the sense that he doesn't respect the system. He doesn't like the system. So so in lies the reason why he ha- he has no reason. Or- Nothing compels Barack Obama to maintain the constitutional system. He doesn't like it. He doesn't like America. He doesn't like it. So in, in, in the same way, Underwood isn't really so ideologically driven as he gets the fact that nobody is going to push back. And if you have that kind of audacious attitude in the White House, you see what's happened. And then, of course, in real life, it's a cocktail. It's a cocktail of Barack Obama's audacious, he's, he's lawless, and he has a gutless, spineless, courageless Republican Party. Those two things are a lethal cocktail, and the, and the, and the, and the country is the one that's poisoned. And so I think they're, they're playing on a lot of those concepts. What can a man do when he's totally lawless with no constitution, no legal pushback? We're going to see what, lawlessness is just running amok in our midst. There's just absolutely nothing that has presented itself thus far willing to push back on it, and the show is mirroring that. And so that's going to be interesting to watch play out because I haven't seen the rest of the season.
I've always thought about this show that there's nothing about watching it that is edifying, and so I always felt like I shouldn't be watching. So if I do lose interest in this, it's almost the silver lining. Well, let me tell you that as film buffs, there is very few, you've got about a dozen, maybe half a dozen, a dozen at the most, uh, directors who have a fingerprint. You watch a film, you know whose film it is. Because their, their, their outlook, their, the way they see things just comes out in the film. You can just tell. This guy is the person that made this film. This David Fitcher, who doesn't direct the film, most of these, but is the executive producer and at least directed a couple of the episodes. He's done Gone Girl, Fight Club, which is uh, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. He's got such a darkness, and you feel so fatigued and morally just beaten by, uh, by the stuff you see when you go to see a Fincher movie. But, he's, but yeah. he also has this... There's this beautiful way he shoots at the same time. You know what the carrot on the stick is? Is he's always honest. He's honest, and I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that anything that you. I would say, if anything, you you really get to see um, the truth of whatever kind of story he's telling at that moment. But it it, it, it is not, dark. It's not a Disney version of a story. It's, it's a Grimm Brothers fairy tale version. And you end up feeling like, wow, I just saw something incredible, but. Man, man, it cost I, me my humanity. It cost me a little bit of my soul. I mean, it's just dark. It's dark. It's yeah. godless. It's cynical. It's it's really French noir is what it is. All right, I got to go, buddy. Okay. Long live the new media. College, culture, dot net.